Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of Choice and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program. From Whale Men to Pirates, Researching Everyday Life at Sea Through Primary Sources, which is sponsored by AM. This session is one in a series of sponsored webinars from Choice and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. All of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. Uh, in the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. To adjust the size of the slides or the video, you can use the divider in the middle of the screen to slide the sizes to your liking. Uh, we are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speakers. I uh, will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. Uh, also note that there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. And with that, we're ready to get started, so I will pass it over to Rosie. Hello everyone. Um, so as I said, my name is Rosie Farrell and I'm a senior editor in the production team at AM. So I will speak, be speaking to you first today to introduce Life at Sea um, and then Richard Blakemore and Hester Bullen will follow up with their talks. So for those of you, <clears throat> excuse me, not familiar with AM, we are formerly Adam Matthew and we work with libraries, archives and heritage institutions to digitize the world's historical and cultural knowledge to aid research. Today, I'm going to introduce Life at Sea, seafaring in the Anglo-American maritime world, one of AM's most recently published resources. Life at Sea draws material from archives in the UK and the US. Um, our two UK partners are the National Archives at Kew and the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich whilst our two US partners are the Massachusetts Historical Society and Mystic Seaport Museum. The resource explores the lives of seafarers in the Anglo-American maritime world during the period 1600 to 1900, though the bulk of the material really is from um, 1700s to the 1800s. It's a socio-cultural resource, taking a bottom-up approach and bringing to the fore the everyday experiences of those at sea. The emphasis of the resource really is largely on narrative content, giving accounts of life on board a variety of ocean going vessels, including merchant and naval vessels, whalers and pirate ships. The nature and scope of the resource has been influenced by our editorial board, which has members in both the UK and the US, and of which um, Richard and Hester are both members. As the core objective of the resource is to uncover the lives of the ordinary seafarer, the focus is very much on the type of documents that will facilitate that. So journals, diaries and logbooks form a large part of the resource, followed by correspondence and memoirs. These documents are often vividly descriptive as well as richly illustrated, offering wonderful insights into life at sea during the age of sail. From the National Archives, we're also including a selection of court martial records dating from 1750 to 1850 from the ADM 1 series, as well as material from HCA 1 and HCA 13, examinations of pirates and other criminals and prize and instance books. Again, these allow study of the life of a wide variety of seafarers through their personal defence testimonies. All of these documents will facilitate the study of a broad range of themes, including recruitment, discipline and punishment, health and welfare, leisure, maritime trade, whaling, warfare, mutiny, piracy, shipwrecks and disasters, port life and life ashore, and women and the sea. All of this fantastic material has been made searchable by handwritten text recognition, of which you can see an example on the screen there. So, I think she said, yes, this is the journal of Emma Hotchkiss, the daughter of Captain Levi Hotchkiss. And she is um, writing a little verse there about feeling homesick. Um, and we hope that this will allow users to dig deep into the sources and pull out perhaps previously hidden aspects of the maritime experience during this period. 
Our indexing approach for this material also focused on uncovering the people within the sources and allowing users to hone in on different types of voyages and different types of experiences. Where possible, we have pulled out details of the author's occupation, for example, were they a surgeon, were they a cook, a carpenter or a chaplain, as well as the voyage purpose, such as whaling, war or trade. We supplemented the primary source content with a range of contextual features available through the research tools area of the resource. Um, so 10 essays and video interviews based on the key themes I've mentioned just before have been commissioned to contextualize and highlight the primary source material in the site. These include an introduction to the social history of seafarers, an essay on exploring gendered life at sea, one on finding black seafarers in the archives, and one on piracy and privateering. These are available alongside other research and teaching tools, such as thematic guides, which highlight some of the best examples of documents from each of the themes I've mentioned, allowing a thematic entry point into the material. There's also a guide to archival collections with detailed information about all of the collections that have been selected for inclusion in this resource, along with links again back into the content. An exciting addition is our interactive map. This charts 10 voyages from a wide range of different seafarers, pulling out passages from their diaries or logbooks. And these really paint a vivid picture of their personal experiences whilst at sea. Not only does it pull out fascinating insights, but it's also a lot of fun to play around with to kind of chart the different voyages. And then whilst I talk about a few document highlights, I've just pulled out some of the visuals from the resource here because it really is, as well as there being very vivid, descriptive manuscript content, they really beautifully illustrated a lot of these documents as well. So we have a wide selection. There's a photograph there of a ship's cook playing the bagpipes. There are beautiful stamps from um, a whaling log book um, photograph, again, at the top of the crew of a ship. Um, so it was found, I found it very difficult to select some document highlights from this resource because I really enjoyed working on it, but I have chosen to talk today about a couple of women's narratives from the resource, um, which I found particularly interesting, not least because they are in the minority. So private journals can be one of the most authentic ways of understanding the experience of people at sea. Um, there's less need for censorship, I suppose, because um, there's no intended recipient, they're not usually sending it home to um, family, for instance, like they would be with their correspondence. So I'm going to highlight journals from two young women, Eliza Nye and Elizabeth Hornby. Eliza Nye's journal was sourced from the Massachusetts Historical Society and she and her family were of New Bedford, Massachusetts. Eliza was just 17 when she recorded her experiences on a trip to the Azores in 1847. Uh, she clearly had a challenging first few weeks and she wrote, I wish I could write something pleasant about the last week, but it has been very dull to me and I have been able to be on deck any of the time until today. She struggles with most, the motion of the ship, feeling sick and not isn't able to eat meals and has to retire early to bed. However, alongside these difficulties, she also describes some really beautiful moments in detail and expresses her gratitude for the experience. One such example is sitting with her family and watching the sunset on the horizon. She says, after tea, we went up on the hurricane house and seated ourselves to see the sunset. And it was a truly beautiful sight to see it sinking slowly into the water, looking like a ball of fire. I have seen beautiful sunsets at home, but I have never seen anything equal to this. After this, her family will sit around together, sing songs and talk about home. And this is a fairly common evening activity on a ship um, that bonds people together as they miss their family and friends back home. The second journal that I've pulled out is that of Elizabeth Hornby and this one was sourced from the National Maritime Museum. Again, she was a young woman at sea and she was accompanying her father, Rear Admiral Sir Phipps Hornby, who was Commander in Chief of the Pacific Station. And her journals date from November 1847 to May 1851. She keeps a really beautifully illustrated journal. There's some really nice illustrations, including one of them passing the equator and Neptune's visit. Um, so she talks a lot about her life on the ship whilst they're on the way to Chile. Um, and it's a very vivid account of what her life would have been like on board. She has all of the concerns you'd expect of a young woman, one being celebrating her birthday. I particularly like 
loved the picture that she paints with this quote. So she says, the captain told me he had meant to burn blue lights for my birthday. Two sailors stood ready at each side with the lights. They burned beautifully and the ship looked so well with the reflection on the sails and the bright light burning on the people. Which I have just found a really beautiful passage to kind of imagine her experiencing that moment. Um, so the voices that come through in the personal narratives in Life at Sea, whether they be in the diaries, court records or correspondence, have really brought the maritime world to life for me and it's been a real pleasure working on this project. And with that, I will hand over to Richard. Thank you very much, uh, Rosie, and hello, everybody. Um, so I'm a maritime historian, uh, and as Rosie said, one of the consultant editors on this uh, database. Um, and I uh, have worked with a particular collection um, that's included in Life at Sea for most of my research career. Um, so that's the High Court of Admiralty paper. So that's what I'm going to talk about here. And what I'd really like to do is just introduce the Admiralty Court papers um, and give you a bit of a taste of what they contain uh, and the really exciting things that they that they have. Um, I've also worked a bit on some of the other things that are included in this collection, such as um, Edward Barlow's journal, which I might say a little bit about and we can talk a bit more about in questions as well. But as a bit of context, I'm particularly interested in social history. Um, and so I've used these papers to write about things like sailors, economics and wages and trading uh, practices, about mutiny, one of those themes that Rosie mentioned that I'm working on at the moment, actually, um, about piracy, about voyages to various parts of the world, including the Americas, West Africa. Um, so I'm going to just introduce the court a little bit and then tell you just some of the interesting cases that, uh, that I have found. Um, so you can see an illustration here on this slide, uh, which is actually from the 19th century, and I mostly work on the 17th century, so it's a slightly later illustration, but you can see in the background the anchor that is the sort of mark of, of, of the, the, the logo, if you like, of the Admiralty Court. And this is actually an illustration of a place called Doctors' Commons, which was a building in London where the Admiralty Court and other uh, courts sat, so it wasn't the only court sitting there. But it was the major maritime law court in Britain, the Admiralty Court, uh, and it mostly dealt with issues arising from shipping, predominantly shipping coming through London, because London was the biggest port in Britain. But if we're talking about shipping through London, we're talking about shipping from all over Britain, all over Ireland, all over the world, from the Americas, from Africa, from the Indian Ocean, from China, and, and, and the papers that we find in um, these uh, records really deal with, with uh, voyages that have come from, from absolutely everywhere. So the jurisdiction of the Admiralty Court um, covers, as you would expect, maritime affairs being a, a part of the Admiralty. And there are two sides to it. One side is the criminal uh, jurisdiction, which deals with piracy and other crimes like murder on ship or theft. Uh, and I have to admit, I haven't worked with that side so much, although I have a PhD student working on it with me at the moment, so I can say a little bit uh, about that side. But I've worked mostly on the civil law, the commercial law side, which deals with disputes like wages and employment, with collisions between ships, with issues around cargo, with commerce uh, and maritime business. And, and it's really rich and detailed into, um, into all kinds of aspects of, of those lawsuits that come up out of shipping, which is why I found it such an interesting resource for social history. Um, I don't appear to have control of the slide, so could we move on a slide, please? Thanks very much. So um, one of the reasons that the Admiralty Court is such a wonderful resource is because unusually for courts at this time, it accepts written testimony. Most English courts do not accept written testimony at this time. And that's because, as you might expect, sailors are traveling uh, away to sea. So the court takes written depositions, such as this one, which is uh, one of those posted in the um, AM uh, collection for Life at Sea. Um, and not only do these very detailed statements in these lawsuits taken as witness statements um, contain a huge amount of information about shipping and life at sea, but they also and I think this is really significant, give us some access to the voices of people who left very little other trace. Most of these sailors, if they're not illiterate, they aren't leaving much in the way of paper records. They aren't leaving much in, in other kinds of evidence. So when they come into this court and give witness statements, it's one of the few moments that, that historians can really see them and can really access them. Um, Obviously, these, these depositions are, are mediated in some ways. Uh, the clerk in the court is writing them down. They're written in very legal 
uh, uh, language. And, and none of them are written for the benefit of historians 400 years later. And I think we do have to remember that. Um, they are written for legal strategies. Everyone, every witness, every litigant is trying to achieve something in this court. So we have to be very sensitive and, and careful about how we, how we use this evidence because they're not just telling us about their lives for the sake of it. But nevertheless, we can, can get these really interesting glimpses through these records. So if we could move on a slide, I'll go on to my first and uh, most detailed uh, uh, case that I'm going to tell you about, which is about a ship called the John and Mary. And this is in the Life at Sea papers, this, this collection. Um, so this ship under uh, a master called William Darrow is sailing to India um, and aboard are two men called Charles Connor and George Kitchingman. And they arrive in June 1682 off the coast of uh, East Africa, uh, near the sort of southern end of Madagascar. And Darrow sends Kitchingman and Connor to trade on the coast of West Africa, of East Africa. So this is a point in, in the 17th century where there isn't a regular European presence in that region of Africa. There is down at Cape Town, there is up at Mozambique, which you can also see about sort of the middle of Madagascar here, but where they are down towards the Southern uh, uh, part of East Africa, there's not a, a, a settled European presence. The boat disappears. And Darrow later claims that his crew have scurvy, he can't hang around, he has to sail on to India. And he goes further and accuses um, the Kitchingman and Connor, the men in the boat with others, of deserting, of being mutinous, of being drunken and disorderly. Although witnesses on their side of the story say that actually they were very diligent, they were very good workers. And this is very common sort of dynamic that we see in these lawsuits. And I'll explain why as we go along. But Connor and Kitchingman on, on their sides um, present witnesses that not only say that they are, are diligent sailors, but also that they were badly equipped in the boat, that they spent three days off the coast at sea because it was too dangerous to land. They were forced ashore. They were captured, stripped, beaten, imprisoned for four months. Some of the companions with them died. And when they eventually escaped, they traveled for 800 miles to the Portuguese factory at Mozambique, surviving, as they say, on crabs and rockweed during the journey before they arrive in Mozambique a year after they first left the ship. And indeed, there's evidence of their descriptions that they're suffering badly from malnutrition by the time they reach Mozambique. Kitchingman dies sometime after that, but Connor finds passage in another English ship and comes back to England. And actually rather astonishingly, given this experience, he arrives in England only a month after the John and Mary, the ship itself gets back to England. And this is where this lawsuit happens. But what's significant here, as with many of these lawsuits, is that it's Connor and Kitchingman's widow who are suing the shipmaster. So they're not being punished for having deserted. They are claiming that Darrow owes them wages. He has refused to pay up and they are suing him to recover these wages. And we see this very often in this law, in, in, in this court. And I think it's one of the reasons why we get so much information from the sailors point of view, because the sailors themselves are the ones pursuing these lawsuits. And what's really interesting here is this is one of the few cases that actually goes all the way through the process to judgment and the judge orders Darrow to pay them their wages. And this too is actually more common than you might expect. Judges were very sympathetic to sailors. Maritime labor was very valuable economically and politically. So we see this too coming out in these court records. Another dimension that this case throws light on that I'd like to highlight is the role of women, which Rosie was also uh, talking about. Because Kitchingman has, has died by this time, but it's his widow who is suing Darrow on behalf of her deceased husband. And she had actually already been economically involved as well. Connor is alive, but he brings a female witness to speak on his behalf, who's a friend of his wife, and who talks about how she and Connor's wife had gone to negotiate for the wages with the shipmaster. So we get these really interesting glimpses, incidental glimpses, into the uh, role that women are playing in these networks. So this voyage, I think, is fascinating, not only because it's really dramatic, I hesitate to use the word adventure because it sounds deeply unpleasant, but it gives us this really interesting glimpse of the lives of, of working people, of ordinary people, of maritime workers traveling, getting into these kinds of escapades, but also of the legal agency that they have to fight their corner and pursue their wages and the role that women are playing in, uh, in, in these maritime networks and communities. And if we can move on to the next slide, I'd like to continue with that theme of um, 
women and the maritime communities. Uh, and this is uh, relating to a case from the 1630s. And I owe uh, my thanks to Colin Greenstreet, who, who leads a group called uh, Marine Lives, who's done some work on these collections as well for, for alerting me to this case. And this is a case, a, a witness statement by a woman called Jane Hendel. Now, Jane Hendel was 50 years old at the time that she gave this statement. She was the wife of a man called James, who was a distiller uh, in Southwark in London, but she had previously been married to a ship carpenter. And what we get is this fascinating little vignette. So one William Hyatt, a shipmaster, and William Yeams, a ship carpenter, meet in Jane Hendel's house, presumably to drink the spirits that her husband is distilling. So as a distiller's house, they're also a meeting point. But having met there and drunk some, some strong spirits, they agree uh, a contract that the ship, master, ship carpenter William Eames will do some work on the ship for William Hyatt. This is to cut gun ports, which you can see illustrated here in this rather nice picture from the, the Lykes Museum in Amsterdam. But having agreed this, they then go to a nearby tavern called the King's Head in Southwark to agree the contract more formally, and they take Jane along as a witness. So she is playing this crucial role in their bargain. But it doesn't end there. She lives near the shipyard. So while Yeams is doing the work, the captain asks her to go along and check that the work is all going OK. And when the work is completed, she goes to look over it and indeed stays to dinner aboard the ship, which I think says something really interesting about ships as, as social spaces as well. She then actually invests in William Hyatt's voyage. And when William Hyatt comes back, he asks Jane Hendel to go to Yeams to ask for more time to pay his debt because he has to pay or sell off his cargo in order to have the money. So not only is Hendel kind of a witness to this original bargain, she's then the linchpin throughout all of these negotiations that come along afterwards. And some of that might come from the fact that she lives in Southwark near the shipyards with her distiller husband. Some of it might come from knowledge she acquired as the wife of a ship carpenter in her previous marriage. But I don't think we should let that obscure the clear technical knowledge that she herself possesses of ships and the important role that she and other women um, are playing in, in these maritime networks and businesses. And, and, and it's very, it's not a common occurrence to find cases like this, but it's always amazing when you, you do find them. And I'm sure there were many other women in those roles, even they if they haven't been recorded in quite so much detail. So could we come on to, to my next slide uh, for my last, uh, and in many ways, I think my favorite case, which is about the voyage of the Neptune again in the 1680s. So you can go and find this in the Life at Sea collection, should you uh, wish. And this is the ship, the Neptune, which is sailing back from the Canary Islands to England and, and hits a storm. And this is why I've got this illustration. This is actually from Edward Barlow's journal. Edward Barlow is a sailor, an autobiographer. His journal is also in the collection. It's beautifully illustrated like many of the other items, as, as Rosie said. And so I thought it would be a suitable uh, picture of a storm because the Neptune also hits a storm. And although they're heading for London, they end up off the coast of Wales. And this is pretty catastrophic uh, detour. It's gonna add months to the voyage. And so when they get back to London, again, there's a lawsuit over whose fault it is. John Perryman, the ship captain, blames his mate, Edward Mann. Edward Mann blames Perryman, and they are arguing over who's more capable. So again, we get these really interesting details about professional skill, about identity, about these kind of maritime communities. But the reason that this case, I think, is so fascinating is that one of Perryman's accusations is that Mann disheartened the crew through terrible oaths and imprecations, and by declaring that the ship and company were bewitched and that the devil came to him in the likeness of a cat and pulled him by the throat. And so then we get to man's own statement in which he says, lying down in his cabin and being disturbed by the mewing of a cat and going to call one of the ship's company to take her away, being then awake, lying on his right side, so great a weight came upon him that he had not power to speak. And turning from his right to his left side, it came upon him again. And he did then and still believes that the cat belonging to the ship was a witch and that something cold like a man's finger had taken him by the collar. This is really spooky stuff, right? He also decapitates the cat and throws it overboard as a measure against witchcraft, which is really quite sad. But I, I can't decide if this is a legal defense, a posture that he is taking to excuse himself from responsibility, or if he genuinely believed in witchcraft. 
But Edward Barlow in his journal, interestingly mentions witchcraft and other sailors mention sorcery and bewitchment of ships. So it's an entirely believable uh, 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 view that Edward Mann actually genuinely did think this was, this was what had happened in that voyage. And I think that's another thing that we can get out of these records is this view on the maritime environment, this view on the sea, these experiences and ideas that these people had during their travels. And if we go on to the last slide, which is another illustration from Edward Barlow, then I'll wrap up here. So we have these glimpses of, of social history. We have these glimpses of the role of women. We have these glimpses of the really dramatic experiences of sailors all over the world. And we also have this sense of the cultural history of the sea and of seafaring. And all of this comes through from these legal records. I hope that's given you a taste of, of what you can find in the Admiralty Court. And I'd like to add that I myself have only scratched the surface. There are many volumes I've never yet had time to look at in this series. And while you never know what you're going to find, I guarantee you're gonna find something good in any one of those volumes. And I think on that point, I'll finish and hand over to Hester. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Rosie, and thank you all for joining us at this conversation. Um, there's nothing I love to talk about more or think about than everyday life at sea and thinking about how the intellectual and social and communal lives of sailors and other passengers at sea um, intersect with the imperative of sailors to work at sea. So most of my scholarship as an English professor who specializes in maritime literature and sailor writing more generally has been thinking about how sailors used the space of their job site, which for most long voyaging sailors was also the space of their non-job site. Their working and their home lives were the same space. There's no going home at the end of a shift at sea if you're a long voyaging sailor. And so my research has been interested in seeing how working men like sailors manage to sustain intellectual, creative, and communal lives while on their job site 24 hours a day. And so the research that I've done, which has taken place um, in many different libraries and archives, uh, predating the moment of the digitization of records, and the, the great joy of being a researcher today is having the opportunity to make use of databases like AM's Life at Sea database, as well as having the opportunity to engage with these materials um, in person when, when time and resources permit. And so what I wanted to talk a little bit about is one area that my research has focused on, which is the reading and literary culture of sailors while at sea. And one of the things Richard mentioned, the, the moments when sailors had achieved literacy and in the course of my research, um, it has uh, become evident to me that by the 19th century, 75% to 90% of working sailors had attained literacy. And in part, this is a imperative because any thought of promotion would require literacy for being able to keep records, the log, um, perform the other kind of tasks that someone who was um, above the rank of a common seaman would have to do. Sailors also had that leisure time to read and study. Um, many naval vessels had naval schools to help bring about both navigational and mathematic skills, but also literacy. Um, but this is a really high percentage for a working class uh, in the 19th century. And so I have been invested um, in my scholarly work in tracking not only how sailors came to read, but what they read, what they preferred, what engaged them and how in turn for many of them this affected their own writings whether in their letters home whether in journals and um, in some cases in published narratives and so i wanted to give you an example uh, that comes from records of the american seamen's friend society which are part of the am database that gives you a sense of how sailors were furnished with books and then what they did with them once they had them. Um, the American Seamen's Friends Society was a charitable organization, one of many that sprung up to devote themselves to the benefit of the moral 
lives of working people. Um, again, many trades had their own equivalent societies, and most of these are proceeding from uh, Christian impulses to ensure that working men, again, in this case, working sailors, um, had access to the good word and had access to moral improvement. Uh, this was part of a, a wave of reform movements in the 19th century. My specialty, again, is in 19th century American um, literary history. And these reform movements were part of a kind of broader reform urge that stressed temperance, not drinking, that stressed reading the Bible, um, and that also encouraged men not to curse. And those of you who spent any time around either sailors or narratives about sailors know that sailors can have a reputation of being profane uh, and godless and prone to drinking. Um, these are cliches. There's an element of truth, certainly, in them. And so organizations like the American Seamen's Friends Society were interested in ameliorating sailors, foul-mouthed, uh, God-forsaking, drinking, whoring ways. Um, and one way that they did this was to provide ships by the thousands with wooden boxes with portable libraries that contained 40 volumes. And the contents of those boxes changed over the years, but those 40 volumes in boxes were literally read to pieces very few of the boxes, the original boxes remain to this day. And the ones that do show extreme signs of use and wear. Very few of the books that were in these libraries remain because sailors often read them to pieces. And so uh, uh, there are several um, museums and archives that have a couple of these boxes. One came to auction recently um, that was priced at $10,000, I believe, um, a sign again of the relative scarcity of these boxes that at one time had existed by the thousands. So um, the source in the AM database that um, is on the screen right now is a pamphlet issued by the American Seamen's Friends Society uh, entitled Ships Libraries, Their Need and Usefulness. And these are really valuable documents in part because Sailors' own writing demonstrates and underscores their access to books and will often list the books. Um, it's less common to find catalogs of the books on ships' libraries outside of official organizations like the Seamen's Friends Society. Some ships would engage in the practices of writing down the books in the library, of cataloging them. That, again, is not um, necessarily something that all of them or even the majority of them do. So as a literary historian, my interest is in seeing what books they took up, what they had access to. Is there a difference between what sailors read when they were able to furnish their own books? There are many accounts throughout this history of sailors all contributing a dollar to buy a collective library for the ship. Uh, depending on the kind of voyage, sometimes the captain would oversee these voyages. Um, but again, in this case, the example that I'm looking at here is the box of 40 books that the American Seamen's Friend Society would provide. And the imperative, the impetus, the, um, the reason they were doing so, as you can see on the right-hand image here, is that it's hard for people to who are ashore to see how sailors can engage in moral, presumably Christian lives here because his workday life on the blue water, um, there's never a Sunday. There's no church going bell. There's no sacred song and there's no sermon. Um, some captains observed the Sabbath at sea. Most did not. It was a workday um, like any other. And then the ship's library, according to the Siemens Friend Society, was one way that those at home who can follow the sailor's progress, um, that in his seclusion at sea, and this is the bottom portion that I've um, expertly highlighted here, um, that this is a great opportunity for the sailor for doing mental and religious good. Um, and then if, if I can have the next slide, please. Part of um, that recognition was that because, again, a sailor's job life was the, on the same site and the same location and the same 
24 hours a day as their place for sober thought, as a place for reflection, as a place for rest or recreation. Job site and the home site are the same place. And for many sailors, this was the setting was conducive to this kind of reflection. It's it, the not only the the water and the sky, the distractions of everyday life, uh, the the times when the mind could be well occupied. And so, for a Christian charitable organization, the um, the idea of filling those hours with something that was for the sailors' improvement again, in a reform moral Christian sense, was important. Sea life can be monotonous. We, you don't get mail. You don't get a daily newspaper. Um, and indeed, sailors in their letters and their narratives record how hungry they are for fresh works to read. When they encounter other ships, they will trade books, and they'll talk about how hungry they are for that fresh content. If I can have the next slide, please. And one evidence, one some of the best evidence that we have for what sailors were reading comes from the reports that the Siemens Friend Society's um, loan libraries would produce. Again, they they provide a list of the books that were given, and a lot of those books are religious guides. They are sermons. They are prayer books. They are moral tales, and clearly. The society hoped that these would be popular and widely read by sailors. But of course, sailors have a choice in what they read. And of those 40 books, again, there's a mix of genres in them usually. Um, and there is some evidence that when sailors had the opportunity to furnish their own libraries, their choices could be quite racier. But in this case, in this report, um, where sailors were encouraged to use the books freely but not abuse them, um, to think of knowledge as power. And the bottom portion of what is on the screen here lets us know that this is information that will be shared with the Sabbath school children who help to raise funds for the library. So this is something that is, we get a sense of how these libraries are being funded, but it's also returning the sailors into the social domestic world at home who to, to feel the care that these children have shown and to feel some measure of responsibility, presumably, for being a good example for the children whose charitable might has been handed on to their interests. Um, and the next slide, please. And so the AM database has an, uh, listed a, a numbered scores, if not hundreds, of these librarians' reports that were provided. And these are absolutely fascinating to me. Um, and some are more detailed than others, but I wanted to highlight in the, the next minute or so a, a couple of these um, reports just to give you a sense of what sailors were reading and what they were engaging with, what really sparked their interests. So on this particular ship, and this is in 1865, um, there were 50 readers who read 115 books according to this catalog. And you'll notice also in the librarian's report on the right-hand column, um, the questions that the Siemens Friends Society is interested in is how many took a temperance pledge, meaning they wouldn't drink? How many knocked off swearing? How many seemed to have improved? Uh, how many religious ceremonies were offered? Who had an awakening? Were there conversions? Were there professing Christians? Um, these are categories that some of the ships fill in and some of them don't. But what I found fascinating here were the books that were most read, which is the highlighted portion here, were Uncle Tom's Cabin and Two Years Before the Mast and Cooper's Naval History. Um, James Fenimore Cooper, to take the third one first, James Fenimore Cooper, who is mostly known in the U.S. today for his leather stocking tales for The Last of the Mohicans, um, was the author of... Um, about 12 nov uh, nautical novels, sea novels, which were wildly popular in the 19th century and are much less read today, as well as a, a work of naval history, which is was also very popular with sailors and is, was popular on this particular ship. Um, two Years Before the Mast was a, a book by Richard Henry Dana, who was a Harvard student who went to sea for the benefit of his eyesight and wrote a absolutely spectacular narrative that if you're interested at all in um, historic sea life, cannot recommend two years before the mass enough, um, where Dana goes on a, a hide trading um, trip to California 
and spends most of his time documenting how much he reads and how he tries to get books from other people, um, as well as walking around the beaches with hides on his head. Um, but then the thing that was most interesting to me here was Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was the overwhelming bestseller of the entire 19th century and was read and adapted and produced the first of what the, the kind of legacy of what is now the McDonald's Happy Meal toys um, was inaugurated by Uncle Tom's Cabin, which produced so much cultural detritus around its production. It makes sense that sailors would be have access to Uncle Tom's Cabin, would know it. It was an absolute sensation. It had been published for 14 years at this point. But the idea that this was still wildly popular aboard ship um, in a ship that is sailing in the last year of the American Civil War um, is a, a really, really cool and unexpected sign of the persistence of that novel um, and why the for the American Seamen's Friend Society, um, it would be important. It's an anti-slavery novel, but it's also an evangelical Christian novel. And so the idea that sailors would be benefiting from this story on those fronts um, again, is, is information that um, I hadn't seen in other contexts. Sailor narratives in talking about what they read, I hadn't come across Uncle Tom's Cabin except in these reports. And the next slide, please. Just a few other examples here where we have 35 crew members who have, most all of them have read books from the library, um, which is striking. We have some more statistics on the uh, hopeful religious improvement front on the right-hand side. Um, but what's interesting about the books that most read here include 10 Nights in a Bar Room is the first one there. It's kind of hard to read the script. And 10 Nights in a Bar Room um, is a sensational and ultimately moralistic uh, tale of why being a drunkard is, is no good. But it's one of those um, great 19th century American texts that has a moral lesson, but also really um, titillates a reader into the kind of escapades that happen um, when one spends 10 nights in a bar room. Um, so that's pretty fantastic as well. And you can see from the um, bottom part of that note under the names of the books most read that most of the books have been read with delight and profit. So sailors are enjoying these books. There's a gesture towards the Seamen's Friends Society that they're profiting from them. You notice that none of the most read books are religious books. Um, next slide, please. And the in this case too, we have a smaller crew, 10 members. All of them were readers. Um, the Books that they most read were and most liked were historical books to this crew seemed to be the most interesting. Um, that's consistent with what I have observed among sailor libraries in general. They love histories. Um, and so that, again, we see the consistency of those interests, not religious books, but they have access to others thanks to this library. Um, and I don't, I, that may be the last slide. I'm not sure. There might be one other. Um, oh, that was all the slides. So, so from these, um, from these records, we get glimpses that both reveal how effective the American Seamen's Friend Society was in furnishing sailors with books, but also we get a glimpse, and this is in, in ways that both Rosie and Richard demonstrate, the moments where the official narrative of the story emerges um, in the, the what emerges in the background or in the margins or um, from below in a lot of these narratives is how the actual humans involved use these resources, use these opportunities and shape them to their own interests and ends. Thanks very much. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Rosie, Richard and Hester. Looks like we can get started with the Q&A. Um, about 15 minutes. So I'll just encourage attendees, if you haven't submitted a question yet, feel free to do so. Okay, we'll start up. We have a question here from Kayla who asks, um, does the database contain any geospatial or other data? Uh, so in terms of um, geospatial data, so a lot of the logbooks contain data as to obviously the location of the ships. 
um, which can be can be mined. I mean, that's what we had to do to create our interactive map. So I do have some idea of how labor intensive that can be, but the data is, is all there. And in terms of um, diaries and logbooks and the types of documents that might contain location data, they make up about 40% of the resource. So there's plenty in there. Okay, great. Let's see, another question here from Tammy who asks, um, did sailors contribute marginalia, doodles, or drawings? If so, what types of marks were made? And um, Hester, maybe if you want to start us off. With pleasure, yes. The marginalia and doodles um, are absolutely present in this database and across sailor writing. And they are some of the most illuminating and exciting things to find and to see. Um, and uh, the beauty of a database like this is that it can often highlight and make more visible and more available those kinds of annotations. Since again, most readers didn't necessarily leave them or they're not accessible to readers more generally. So for example, if I am a scholar who's going to visit a special collections or a library or an archive, that library might have an edition of a book that I'm interested in studying. And that edition may not have been owned by somebody who provided marginalia or notes. And so having access to scan, and this is the one of the limitations of something like a Google Books when one works with historical texts, the scanned version might include some such materials, but in order to get a better sense for scholars often to see how those books were read, how they were handled, um, to have a pristine copy in a library often means that somebody didn't read it very well or closely. If the binding is tight, if the pages have not been doodled on upon, it's great for preservation purposes, but it's not great for judging reading practices. So yes, there's marginalia, there's doodles, and this shows us how readers interacted with texts and gives a glimpse that we, again, his, for those of us who study the history of texts and the history of readers, is relatively harder to come by. Not enough people leave a reading journal or reading diary. Um, there, there is not as widespread a use of something like a Goodreads um, in uh, earlier periods than there is today. Got it. It's unfortunate. <laughs> Um, no story graphs. Could I just then. add a quick comment on that? Sorry, it, it, I know it was a, a question first, but I think there's some interesting points out about some of the other items from earlier in the collection, which is what, what I've worked on, where, where there's obviously less marginalia because they're official documents, but the sailors do sign or, or mark their, their witness statements, which some people have used to look at literacy. And actually, as, as you said, Hester, sailors are more literate than many other people in the population. Unfortunately, I would love to have the evidence that you have for the for the 17th century, but sadly not, not much of that. But then Edward Barlow's journal, which I, which I mentioned as well, is a sailor's autobiography from the 17th century, which is written probably in his own hand and in some very distinctive spellings. And he says that he learned to write at sea uh, during his maritime career. And so he's spelling in this really phonetic way so you, you, some of these elements that are um also in in the, the the am collection do bring out some of those things for the earlier periods as well and i think in really interesting um comparisons to to what hester's been talking about great thank you both um this is sort of in relation to you know traces left behind um one question here is is there any way to know if these books were read aloud to others in addition to being read by an individual Yes, that's something that um, sailors are uh, associated with storytelling practices. Um, you've probably heard the term a yarn is usually the term used to refer to sailors storytelling practices. And so that's part of a kind of collective performance of literacy. And so there are, I've certainly seen references to people reading books aloud, but because again, um, the reading that sailors do on shipboards is necessarily what historians of reading call intensive reading versus extensive reading. So extensive reading is if you have access to a lot of books and you, you know, will pick and choose among them and somewhat glancingly. But intensive reading is if you have 40 books on ship, you're going to read those books closely. And so um, when you have a smaller access to a library, that collectivity can make its way both into the performance of reading aloud, which certainly happened, as well as to that shared sense of shared text, since they all had access to a relatively limited body of text. And I haven't seen any evidence of anyone um, hoarding books to keep them 
from others. Um, there may be libraries that are reserved for officers that have more to do with navigation or some kinds of histories, but in general, books were understood as part of that collective performance of storytelling. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here, uh, one from Jacob, who asks, are there any objects in this collection? If yes, what are some examples? I can take that one. Um, yes, we have got two exhibitions full of objects, um, and those were sourced from the Mystic Seaport Museum and also from the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. And those, um, with the help of one of our editorial board members, have been kind of loosely categorized into objects that might have been found in a like everyday um, seaman's chest or a captain's chest. Um, and some examples are one of my favorite objects is a beautifully um, painted domino box. So an, uh, an example of some kind of leisure activity. Um, there's also a violin and a fiddle. There's quite a few examples of um, scrimshaw, so where um, illustrations have been kind of carved into whalebone. Uh, what else do we have? There's a the sailor's dish. Um, there's a ship's biscuit. There's a whistle. There's some very beautiful stripy trousers. So a, a real selection of objects um, from those two archives. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, we have another question here uh, from Virginia, who asks, asks how similar or, or different are the collections of books for sailors to the libraries for lighthouse keepers? Sorry, I pose, I pose that very strangely, but um, <laughs> no, that, that, that's great. Um, it's a great question. I've seen some lists um, of the books available to lighthouse keepers, but it's been a while and I don't remember what the differences are. Um, it's possible, my guess and rough memory may be that because of the length of time on sailors voyages, the there are more kind of compendia and histories and anthologies um but that is just a a, a guess i do recall seeing a few library lists for lighthouse keepers but that is hasn't been a primary area of my research so i'm sorry i can't give you more detail about that got it okay um let's see another question here from joelle who asks are there any resources about seafaring in the Pacific Ocean? I am specifically interested in anything related to Northern California. Oh, that is a good question. It's fairly global in terms of the, the spread, but I, if you are able to give me your email address, I can have a look for some specific voyages and see if there are any that would be interesting to you um, in your particular area of research. Great, yeah, and um, see, Rosie, you could probably put your um, email address maybe yeah, in the I'll put chat. Email address in the chat and, yeah, perfect. Okay, let's see. Okay, for another question here. Okay, we've one here from Anthony who asks, "Have you found records of American sailors reading at sea before the 1850s?" Uh, yes, um, the again, my the focus of my research has largely been on the 19th century. Um, but since the the so-called golden age of American shipping and American maritime trades, and certainly whaling, is in that 1820s to 1860 moment, um, there's certainly a lot of documentation um, from sailors, either in their letters, their journals their narratives um, about that kind of reading practice. And part of that availability of those um, uh, of that those narratives and that information is that for the kind of print technologies and increased access to publication that was available to non-elites, um, not just to working men like sailors, but to women and enslaved people and the incarcerated and to soldiers, um, the ability to have one's story printed and distributed through both printing technologies, but uh, networks of distribution gave access to a literary sphere 
um, to many people who, again, would not necessarily have had that kind of access before. And so we are indebted to those moments, those transitions for making more of that kind of material available. Um, my guess is that, again, Richard is absolutely right that literacy rates were not as high in the 17th century um, among sailors from what I can understand and guess. Um, I'm sure those practices were happening, but access to the records of the, the common laborer um, are a little uh, less available than um, they are in this later period. But again, databases like this one can help surface those that are. If I could add a quick comment on that, on that area here, since you mentioned it, Hester, I, there, there is definitely evidence of that reading. I mean, the fact that Barlow learns to write as he suggests he's reading and he mentions reading, although often in kind of quite oblique ways, but there's also lots of records of sailors' wills with, with books. But my favorite example, which some of you may have seen, because it was in the news um, only a few years ago, was an archaeological dig on, on the pirate Blackbeard's ship off the coast of the Carolinas, and they found a fragment of paper from a book in, in the wreck showing that there were books even on pirate ships. Um, and what I particularly like is that the, the scrap of paper they found was a book about pirates. So pirates had a book about pirates on their pirate ship, although it was found in a cannon, so it may have been used as wadding. So it's not clear whether they were reading it or just using it for practical reasons. But I think there are much longer histories of reading at sea that, that kind of feed into the, the later period that you've been talking about. Mm, great. Okay, yeah, another question sort of about literacy uh, from Hillary who asks, do sailors on whale ships have different reading, writing, literacy patterns than those on either naval or other commercial vessels? I'll jump in on this too, <laughs> but again, you know, Richard or Rosie, um, please uh, chime in as, as needed. Um, so whale ships are, are really interesting and have, um, in the present moment, have a probably better social reputation than they did in the 19th century. And that's because of the visibility of Melville's Moby Dick. Um, whaling was the dirtiest and most dangerous and least appealing and worst paid and longest form of seafaring um, other than working on a slaver. Um, it is, uh, there's a reason why whale ships are the most racially, ethnically and nationally diverse. Um, which is a good thing, but that's also because um, it was not deemed to be elite maritime labor. Um, whaling was open to a wider range of people because, again, of its dangers and its difficulties. So um, as a result, given access and opportunity, um, it's harder to kind of quantify literacy rates on whale ships, the presumption is that they may not have matched um, the levels of some other nautical trades. And I think that that's reasonable, but certainly yes, there is evidence of um, libraries on whale ships. A lot of that is often furnished by those ships that had a, a chaplain aboard, which not all do, most don't. Um, but there are times when um, the, the chaplain will provide an account of his labors on behalf of the men, much like the Siemens Friends Society. And that's one of the places where we can see it. But whaling is, whale, whaling voyages are tend to be four years long and the uh, risks are enormous. So it's, again, <laughs> there's more leisure and more time for such reading. Um, and again, famously, the origin story of Moby Dick is a long whaling voyage. Um, but uh, it, it's it's certainly a different um, class of laborers, again, for, for better and for worse. Got it. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more. And I think, Rosie, maybe you could answer this one. Um, do we find a good amount of materials related to John Franklin's expedition in the Canadian Arctic in search of the passage of the Northwest? We know in the last few years, his two ships were found in the Arctic. Yes, I was very interested to read about that because I worked on our one of our other databases, Age of Exploration, which is where you would find material on Franklin. There's loads of really interesting material in there. So yes, I would recommend if that is your particular area of interest, then perhaps Life at Sea is not the database and you would go for Age of Exploration, but they are cross searchable. So if you have access to both you can cross search across age of exploration and life at sea because as you can imagine there's a, a lot of crossover there in terms of content and themes. 
Okay, great. I think we're just at the hour. So I'll just say thank you so much to Rosie, Richard, and Hester for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you to our attendees for your engagement with your questions and comments. I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording. Um, I'll also give you a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey. We'd really appreciate it. Um, so thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the session, and we hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. <laughs>